Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of the Lord. For the purposes of this morning, I'm first of all going to assume that none of you knows about the illness that, uh, that left me almost bedridden for sem- seven months back in 2008. Uh, I've only met some of you recently, so some of you have no idea um, about that part of my story. So that seems the best way to proceed. So if I say things that you already know, uh, if I tell some stories that you've heard before, I'm sorry if I'm you know, starting to sound like a, you know, somebody who, who's forgotten you know, the stories they tell and, you know, and, uh, you know, and tells them again and again and again. You know, you know what I mean. You know, the kind of the stories that my mum tells again and again. Bless, bless her heart. Um, if she was here, I wouldn't have said that because that... <laughs> Last time she was here and I said something about my mum, that caused a problem. So she normally sits about there, but she's somewhere else today. Um, when I visited Kenya recently, I said I have one wife and three children. And I'm sure you're very glad it's not the other way around. And there was a kind of a ripple of laughter through the, uh, through the church. Because seriously, um, you know, the Kenyans do really appreciate that the man might just have one wife um, and only three children. So that's... Uh, you know, that was, that was good. I worked in the banking industry for 14 years between 1986 and 2000 before spending two years at, the, at a Church of England vicar factory, otherwise known as Trinity College in Bristol. And for the last six years, uh, I have been and will continue to be the vicar here. I was first ordained or licensed as a church minister in June 2002 in Winchester Cathedral. And after 10 years of service, we're allowed to apply for this thing called a sabbatical uh, or extended study leave. And only last week I was talking to somebody who said, so you've just been on a sabbatical, that must mean you're about to move churches then. Because that is the assumption. You go away on a sabbatical and you kind of get this, well, you get itchy feet, don't you? I said, well, no, it's not crossed my mind at all. That's not why I've had a sabbatical um, and it's not in my thinking. So I took mine from the 25th of June to the 6th of October 2012, and I'm, I'm sure that what I learned and what I experienced is going to stay with me for the rest of my life. A few weeks ago, when I was preparing to give this talk for the first time, or rather a version of this talk, uh, for my dystonia support group, I was very aware that my head was pulling quite severely at that point towards my right shoulder, and it was a reminder of this frustrating thing um, that... Uh, that has, you know, that has afflicted me. And it began to afflict me just four months after I moved here. We moved here in May of uh, 2006, and it was in September of 2006 that I first became aware of the symptoms. Nothing to do with moving to Billericay. Um, no idea why um, it came on. The dystonia on, in my neck, and it's got all sorts of different names. Sometimes it's called uh, cervical dystonia. Um, But because when people hear cervical, they they think of uh, cervical cancer, it's now been renamed neck dystonia. It's sometimes called spasmodic torticollis. Basically, when I was at my worst, my right ear was touching my right shoulder, and my face was pointing in that direction, uh, and it was absolute agony. Um, uh, The the condition that I have is treated with botulinum toxin, uh, otherwise known as Botox. Um, did any of you see the, the, the headline in the, uh, in the Gazette a few years ago that said, Vicar says, thank God for Botox? I, don't know if... <laughs> I never showed any of you the, the, uh, the article because I was only slightly embarrassed about it. But it was, it was great that they, they had wanted to print the story and they did put a very good spin on it. Um, so I get Botox injections every three and a half months. I get five in different parts of my neck. Um, My only complaint is that after four years of Botox, my neck is not looking any younger at all. Um, I'd hoped I'd get the neck of an 18-year-old, but it's still the neck of a 44 and a bit year old. Um, 
When I was finally diagnosed in June of 2008, I sent an email out to uh, some, of my, uh, some of my closest friends. Um, one of them, a joker, uh, my good friend Ian Fletcher, he emailed back and he said, that explains it, Warner. We have always known that you were a massive pain in the neck. <laughs> now, you see, I can, I can kind of hear by a few of the... Mm, you're not sure if it's okay to tell a joke like that about someone with an impairment or a disability, are you? Mm, not so sure. I mean, Paul, your groan was kind of... I was slightly worried about your groan. You know, being a teacher, you know, you obviously have to be quite politically correct, really, don't you? You know, and, you know we were talking about marking and how you have to mark in a politically correct way. Work. Yeah, green pen, not red. You're not allowed to say anything negative. It's always got to be positive, you know, all, all this politically correct stuff. Um, you know, but I wonder how you react to hearing that kind of joke. See, I love jokes about stiff necks. I really do. You know, and, of course, they're there all throughout the Old Testament, aren't they, you stiff-necked people? You know, I, I love all that stuff. You know, because to me, having a sense of humour helps me to make some sense of life or just to make some nonsense of life, really. Um, you know, to, to, to be able to joke uh, about my situation helps me no end. Now, even though the joke's on me. Uh, Ian knows that the joke he told is precisely my sense of humour, so it works, and that's fine. The thing is, people who don't have dystonia don't tend to find the joke funny, whereas we who do think it's hilarious. So why is that? What's, what's going on there? Uh, so in June 2008, before diagnosis, I was almost bedridden. I mean, I could walk about, but I literally had to kind of grab my head like this, and you know, most of, pretty much most of every day I was either on the sofa or uh, in bed. So walking, sitting, moving around, agony. Fast forward two years to June 2010, and uh, I'm not going to show you the video, although I do have it. I completed a five-kilometer fun run in aid of St. Luke's Hospice. Um, both my sons thrashed me to, in a sprint to the finish line, um, Stephen got there first out of the three of us. Matthew said, oh, yeah, I'll run round with you, Dad. And then about 300 metres from the end, he just <laughs> absolutely zipped away, and I had absolutely no chance of catching him. And that was fine, you know, sons beating you to the line and all that. But as I considered my progress, uh, I recalled that during 2008, the worst year of my life, and I doubt I'll have uh, a worse year physically, the worst year physically of my life, I had grown and developed as a person. I've still got a lot of growing and developing to do, but I grew and developed as a person a lot. Whilst horizontal, I listened to more music, read more books, listened to more talks on the internet than ever before in my life. Physically, I hadn't run or walked for months. However, in my mind and my spirit, it seemed that I was making some progress on the road of life. There were days when I felt mentally low. But the sense of peace and purpose in my life was, uh, was tangible. A sense of progress as a person. And yet, I couldn't, I couldn't get up, couldn't do anything. All I could do was lie there. So why then, why two years later, when I was able to complete this five-kilometer fun run, why... Did I not then feel as peaceful as I had two years before when I was horizontal and could do nothing? What was going on there? I had these questions. And after discussion with some people that I trust a great deal, uh, with a, uh, in particular with a colleague who I'd never met before, I applied for this sabbatical, this extended study leave, and we came up with a title. And in some ways, the title is just a little ironic. You know, there's a... There is a tinge of irony. There's a tinge of humour. But the title is uh, a serious one. So especially in the light of my experiences, your experiences, and the lives of many other people, you know, think of Paralympic athletes, for example. I mean, how inspiring were they this summer? I thought they were just incredible. Just incredible. I mean, Margaret, I think during one of your sermons, you told us about the, the former serviceman who... Had he had his arms and his legs blown off, or, or his leg, he'd had his legs blown off, he'd been zipped in a body bag, presumed dead, 
prayed a prayer at that point, you know, Lord, well, I'm sure there was help, but, you know, recommitting himself to God. A few years later, winning, did he win gold? Well, he, I, he, he, he did fantastically well for the British Paralympic team, I think in the shot put, I think, wasn't it? I mean, incredible, from body bag to Paralympian shot putter. I mean, that was just one of so many inspiring stories. I mean, if you feel as if you're not that far away from a body bag, you could still yet be the equivalent of a Paralympian shot putter. So the title that that we came up with was How Do We Run the Race When We Can't Run? How do we run the race when we can't run? The Bible talks about the life of faith being like a race. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And the race of life, if you want to call it that, is more like a marathon than a sprint. Um, you know, if we, we can sprint for a bit, but then we get exhausted and we kind of collapse in a heap. You know, I, I think we have to approach life as more like a marathon and the stages in life as a marathon rather than a sprint. The Bible talks about training our minds, training our character, training the person that I am, you know, for example, as an athlete trains and prepares for the games, and you could find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, if you wanted to look that up. So my, my sabbatical, my extended study leave, it had to include three elements. It had to include renewal, retreat, and rest, and I was able to enjoy all three of those in abundance, and I'm, I just want to say thank you. you know, thank you to you as a church. The, the church council had to agree to it. Uh, I'm very grateful that you did. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to the diocese. Thank you to the bishop for agreeing to my request. Um, Some pictures very, very quickly. Um, Top left, uh, that's some of the food uh, that we put together at a barbecue at the New Wine Summer Conference. Um, Top right, uh, you can see the the group from Christchurch that went to the New Wine Summer Conference last year. We had a fantastic time together. Then moving down to the middle on the left, um, that is part of the venue uh, of our place. Um, For the second second week of the New Wine Summer Conference, I served on team working with children with disabilities. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Uh, That's the the venue. Middle on the right, the Olympic Stadium. Um, We saw some athletics. Bottom left, uh, there's me serving as a games pastor with one of the security guards. Bottom middle, that's me again at the foot of the steps at Stratford. Um, It was hot, uh, but it was great. Bottom right, that's me and that's Maxwell, the vicar of Sheermander, uh, just after I had prayed for and given thanks for the new meeting room at the church in Kenya. So what else did I do? Well, I began with a retreat at a Roman Catholic monastery, interesting. Uh, I went to St. Augustine's in Chilworth in Surrey, and it was just such a wonderful, quiet, peaceful, relaxing place to be. I really enjoyed my conversations with, uh, with Brother Thomas, a monk from Madagascar, and uh, he was just lovely. He's a charismatic Catholic monk, and it was just lovely. And the hospitality of the monks was humbling. Their way of life was challenging. During my stay at the monastery, I finished a book that I'd already begun, but I finished a book written by Sandra Lacey. Now, some of you have heard me refer to this book before. Um, She's the widow of a poet and an actor called Rob Lacey. Rob and Sandra were married in 1995. Rob died in 2006, aged 36. And Sandra's very moving book is, uh, is called People Like Us, Life with Rob Lacey. I've got the book here. Sandra is a Christian, and Rob also lived the Christian life with all of its ups and downs. He was diagnosed with bladder cancer just shortly after their wedding in 1995. And I just want to read three very short excerpts from Sandra's book. First of all, um, some additional wedding vows that Rob penned for their wedding. If I'd thought about this properly, I could have got maybe Moira and I to do this together, but I'm just going to do this myself because I haven't asked her. 
So just imagine uh, two people. Sandra is first, so I'll kind of go Sandra, Rob. So Sandra, Rob, here we go. For richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. If you become a snorer, if you don't support Spurs. In, where are you? In sickness, in illness, in tiredness, in touchiness, in just under the weatherness, yes, and in health, in strength, in strident, in vibrant, in crazy when I want to be quiet, in amuse when I want to riot, in a rage, in every stage, in stumble, fumble, foible and fault, indestructible, invincible, impenetrable vault. So, in sickness and in health, till death us two part, so help us God, so help us God. What God has brought together, taught to float, set to sail, and sent to sea. And then they both said together, let no one put us under. Uh, the day that Rob received his devata- devastating diagnosis is the next bit. His envelope delivered not only a sheaf of photocopied papers, but utter devastation. One sentence in particular stood out. Bladder cancer kills 100% of people who contract it. For some reason, Rob was in the bathroom reading the statistics. After a while, his stillness and quietness drew me to him. He simply passed a piece of paper to me. Nobody survives it. His whisper drifted on the air as I scanned the information. When I looked up, his eyes were filled with tears. The outside world made its faint noises on the other side of the window. A tap dripped. My heart thudded and my breathing became shallow. This was unreal. It could not be happening. My hands started shaking as we held on to each other. We wept inconsolably. Sinking to the floor, we clutched at the life that was each other as the implications of the facts tumbled around our brains. No one survives bladder cancer. Treatment might involve being unable to have children. We would have no family of our own, no grandchildren. Pain and ongoing treatment lay ahead. Rob might die. We would not grow old together. The third is a poem written by Rob in 2000, so several years later, as he became more determined than ever to live life to the full, to run the race set before him, whatever the future might hold. And he wrote this. It's called Heavy Cross. How can carrying a heavy, rough-hewn cross help me look up more? How can carrying a heavy, rough-hewn cross Help me stand taller. How can carrying a heavy, rough-hewn cross help me run the race better? How can carrying a heavy, rough-hewn cross help me keep the pace longer? How can carrying a heavy, rough-hewn cross help me carry others stronger? It's bizarre, but I believe it. So I pick up my heavy, rough-hewn cross and put it on my back. My spirit soars. My rage against injustice roars as I carry the cross for the cause. Quite an inspiring book. Um, Rob, if you don't know, wrote, um, he wrote a book called The, uh, the Liberator. Uh, he wrote The Street Bible, uh, more recently renamed The Word on the Street. I find that biographies speak to me so much more than, uh, than academic books. I'm not an academic, so a story of life against the odds uh, really stirs me. It's my favourite kind of book. Uh, there's another one that, again, I know that some of, you, uh, some of you heard me mention before. It's the story of Charlie Wedemeyer. 
Uh, some of you will remember him. Some of you may never have come across him before. Uh, Charlie was an American football coach. Uh, sorry, he was an American footballer turned uh, football coach. Age 30, uh, he was diagnosed with something called Lou Gehrig's disease. He was given 12 months to live. During the years that followed, he, uh, he became a Christian. He, uh, he came into a relationship with God. Fifteen years after being given 12 months to live, Charlie was confined to a wheelchair and was paralyzed. But he could still communicate with his eyes. That was his only form of communication. But he continued to coach his American football team with his eyes. He would pass on instructions to his wife using eye movements, and she would convey the instructions to the team. His Christian faith and his determination to live life was an inspiration to people who knew him and to me as I studied and as I read once again his biography. I think what I realize is that by comparison, I have so much and I have so many choices available to me. A few weeks into my study leave, I slowly read through an old book called Blessings by Mary Craig. I don't know if any of you have come across Mary. Uh, she wrote this in 1979. Mary's second child, Paul, was born with a, con a condition known as gargoyalism or Hurler's syndrome. Now, life was incredibly hard for Mary. But in her book, she writes about how her life and her perceptions began to change when she began volunteering with a charity that helped survivors of the Holocaust. Mary spent occasional weeks serving at the Sue Ryder Foundation home in Cavendish in Suffolk. And she later spent time in Poland with Sue Ryder. And in her book, Mary explains how she learned so much from Holocaust survivors. People who had suffered so much had so much to give. And this is what she writes about the Holocaust survivors. It was two-way traffic, of course. The miracle was that the survivors, in being helped, gave so much in return. They had learned lessons about human values, which only those who had lived with death could have learned. They had gained an extra dimension because they had learned what was important in life and what was not. And because in their own daily lives they were passing on that lesson, Perhaps in the world's terms, they were abject failures. Every one of them was sick, poor, and unable to work with a life that was going nowhere. But as I left Poland, I knew that they were rich beyond measure. And I envied their wholeness, if not the paths by which they had come to it. So as I said, during my time away from work, I spent two weeks at the New Wine Summer Conference in Shepton Mallet, and it was week two when I was serving on place at our place. So it's a venue primarily for children with special needs, um, but also as a refuge for their parents. And it was just an incredible week. I mean, as is often the case, words fail me. I mean, I, ha I had no clue as to what I could possibly offer to a room full of children with special needs who I'd never met before, and I'd never worked with children with special needs before. So um, really had no idea at all. But once I started playing and fooling around and treating the children as far as possible as if they were my own, I got on absolutely fine. Uh, on one occasion, uh, our group came together, and we did this at the end of every morning, or a variation of this, and we came together to pray together. So we sat together in a circle with some quiet music in the background. Now, Naomi, our group leader, was just fantastic at this. Uh, on this particular occasion, she, uh, she took a cloak and wrapped it around the shoulder of each child, one by one, uh, gently around their shoulders. This, this is all with their parents' permission. Um, and then just, just prayed a prayer for each child by name, naming them one by one. And then moving on to the next one. Fifteen minutes later, uh, 
uh, a boy with Down syndrome came over to me and he had this cloak, this little cloak in his hands. And he came and he wrapped it around my shoulders. I thought, I wonder what's going to happen next. He then closed his eyes. He put his hands together. He mumbled something, no idea at all what he mumbled. But the last word was very audible. Amen. And he took the, uh, the cloak off my shoulders and he went off to play. And I thought, that was wonderful. Ten minutes later, he came back with the cloak. I, I just find it interesting that the cloak, of course, was just wrapped right around the most troublesome part of my neck. He brought it, he wrapped it around my neck again, closed his eyes, bowed his head. He mumbled, I do not know what, and said, Amen. It's probably the second most moving moment in my life. I've, so, I've told some of you the first, and I'll, uh, I'll maybe save that for another, for another day or in a conversation, but I, uh, well, there were tears in my eyes. It was a most profound moment. I could tell you all sorts of other stories. I could tell you uh, about a boy brain damaged from birth who when I first met, I thought, I've got no idea what he's aware of. But we, we, we formed a bond, which was just really uh, yeah, something that is so difficult to describe. I, I could tell you about Sam with severe cerebral palsy, but I don't think I've got time today. But each of these children was, was just a wonderful blessing. So I served uh, for 10 days as a games pastor, as I said. We were based just outside Stratford Station. Um, we were seeking to make a difference during the games. We spent a lot of time talking to the police uh, and shop owners. We, we were also helping people who were lost or disoriented. Uh, we were praying for people if that's what they wanted, if that's what they asked for. We were telling people about the reason for the hope that we have as Christians. Um, I chatted briefly to Victoria Arlen. You may remember she was Ellie Simmons' main swimming rival. Um, there had been a bit of controversy about whether she was starting to recover uh, a little bit. Um, I chatted with a coach from the Iraqi team. I mean, that just seems so surreal, you know, bearing in mind the history. Uh, a doctor with the Hong Kong team, two athletes with the Rwandan team, and they were all just so inspiring. Uh, a week in Kenya in September, uh, lived with Maxwell, the, the vicar of Shiamanda. Again, I could probably do a whole talk about my visit to Kenya, but I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to spend too long on that today. But once again, the generosity in sharing out of the little that they have, um, just the generosity was, uh, uh, was so touching. And uh, it's lovely to be able to say that Maxwell and Pauline uh, are going to be visiting the UK uh, towards the end of September next year, and they're going to be joining us for our church weekend away. Uh, and I think this is wonderful news. The church council agreed to this recently. Um, we think it's going to help us as a church immensely uh, by Maxwell and Pauline coming to spend time with us. So they'll be here for, for 12 days. That'll include the church weekend away, and we'll all get an opportunity to get to know them. Um, I realize my talk is quite long this morning. I, I, I could apologize, but um, I'm not going to. I'm sorry. Um, I'll just say, I'll just say f forgive me. Um, I, I know it's quite long. I haven't got much more left to say, but I do want to show you a short video. Um, Victoria Arlen's story, which you can find on the internet, um, is just incredibly moving. As I, uh, as, I, as I watched her story, again, I just had tears rolling down my cheeks. Such a beautiful girl. A top, top swimmer, struck down by a virus. Uh, as she slept, that in the long run has left her paralyzed from the waist down. Um, but when she was first struck down with the, uh, with the virus, I mean, she was just completely unable to do anything. I mean, the, the amount of recovery is really remarkable. But as I watched one of the videos about her and her, her, um, her family are Christian believers, I noticed this quote on the video from Antonio Smith. Enjoy the little things in life. 
But one day you may look back and realize they were the big things. Or how about this one from Josh Billings? Life consists not in holding good cards, but in playing those you hold well. The pivotal point, and I just don't have words to, yeah, words fail me once again, sorry. Sometimes I'm okay with words, sometimes they just, they just fail me. The pivotal point of my sabbatical was the story of Nick Vujicic. Uh, I saw his book just staring at me from a bookstall, and I thought, I have got to read that book. I did a double take, I did a treble take, and I still do a double take and a treble take every time uh, I see it. The man born with no arms and no legs. Born with no arms and no legs. At the age of 10, Nick considered committing suicide in the bath. By this point, he could actually swim. He could swim. Not just float, he could swim. He considered committing suicide in the bath. But as he flipped himself over, face down, he believes that he heard the voice, the audible voice of God, telling them that he had a plan and a purpose for his life. And he flipped himself back over again. Nick is now an inspirational speaker who travels the world uh, encouraging people of all ages, but especially teenagers. He swims, he sings, he skateboards. I can see your minds are in overdrive now trying to work this out. I'm going to show you in a moment. He scuba dives, he skydives. That sounds incredible, doesn't it? We've got so much, haven't we? We've got so many choices available to us. He says in his book, and this is why it was the pivotal moment, come walk with me, the man with no arms and no legs. And I want to show you his music video. Where do we go when hope runs out? When we're empty? When there's nothing left? I'm 
another day or night I know there's something more than what we're living for I see it in the stars, I feel it on the shore I know there's something this world may crumble into the ocean It could all end tonight I am the man you Then try to find you My only source of old, I tried to commit suicide. I had lost my hope. I tried to drown myself, but I couldn't do it. God had a plan for my life, to give hope to other people through my story. We get one life before we meet face to face with our creator. And what I find is that nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that faith in God equals some kind of easy life without sickness, sin, or sorrow, or suffering. Because I believe that faith in God begins with an awareness that there is more to life. A creator who made us and loves us. You know, we're all going to face different challenges and different disappointments, things that hold us back or get in the way um, of faith or get in the way of the things that we want to do. But I believe that we have a saviour, Jesus. Jesus who lived the perfect human life, even to the point of suffering death on the cross. Despite being innocent, he committed no sin. No deceit was upon his lips. We think that his father Joseph died while he was still a young boy, leaving his mother Mary as a young widow. The people of his hometown rejected him. They wanted nothing more to do with him. He committed no crime. He was falsely accused. The religious leaders said that Jesus was a child of the devil. People told lies about him at his trial. He was spat upon. He was sentenced to death. 
he was nailed to a tree. His friends ran away and deserted him. When Jesus died, he could not move. He was paralyzed. His muscles had become useless and he could no longer suck in air. We get one life. We get one God-given opportunity to run the race with perseverance marked out for us. God doesn't promise us in this life to take away sickness, trouble, or adversity, but he does promise to walk with us through it and to take us through it. Hence, these famous words from Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I've come to the end of my study leave with more questions than I had at the start. So I'm, I, I have made no simple conclusions. Um, but I know that I've been inspired uh, and encouraged by many people to make the very best of this one life that I get. Uh, and I want to pray that you too will make the very best of the one life that you have. I'm sorry it's been so long, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, some of us do face some big and difficult trials, challenges, obstacles uh, in our lives. It might be sickness, bereavement, unemployment, family issues, people that we find hard to forgive. Lord, I pray that you'll please come by your spirit. Please come and minister encouragement, healing and wholeness and fresh purpose to each one of us. Lord, please help each of us to make the most of the opportunities that we have to follow the Lord Jesus and to make the very best 